because of the twist of it. Um, mm -hmm. Because they don't realize that he's underwater. Oh, oh! I just gave away the <laughs> spoiler anyway. alert. <laughs> <laughs> spoiler alert is right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and he's such a lovely man. So that was that was so cool. So that makes that twenty six years ago. Ah, yikes! That's crazy. That is it crazy. Is. It um, is. Yeah. So you've been on this journey a little while then. Yeah, I, you know, I got interested in orcas when I moved to Seattle in 1982. Yeah. And uh, it just started then and grew and grew and grew and grew. <laughs> wow, so yeah. exciting. So exciting. Well, we're so pleased to have you here with us tonight. Looks like we're going to get started in just a minute. And I just see that someone is going to be joining us from Saudi Arabia tonight. So that is very exciting that we are able to reach such a global audience for this fabulous book. So mm. um, that is exciting. That is exciting. Mm -hmm. So I want to say greetings and hello. My name is Holly Myers. Uh, I am joining uh, you from Elliott Bay Book Company. Uh, I am joining you tonight from Elliott Bay Book Company. We are on traditional Coast Salish land, and we are so pleased this evening to be joined by Donna Sandstrom, who I don't know if anybody heard, we were just talking, Donna and I met, uh, we think in 1995 at Elliott Bay Book Company when we were down in Pioneer Square. We were, Elliott Bay was hosting a wonderful children's book author by the name of Paul Owen Lewis, for his title called Storm Boy, which is about, uh, it's a, a Native American journey uh, through the sea with orcas and the art is truly incredible. Uh, so Donna's been on this journey for a little while now and we're very excited to have her join us here this evening. Uh, if you have questions, feel free. I would be very happy to help uh, Feel those uh, as we go along, but I think having done all of that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our guest, Donna. Welcome, and I know you have a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much, Karen. I uh, I want to say also thank you to uh, Elliot Bay for hosting me. This is a uh, an incredible privilege and an honor to be um, working with you on this. And I wanna, um, in case anyone's uh, watching from Kids Can Press, I wanna thank my publisher for making this possible also. And Sarah Burwash, the illustrator, um, who really brought this story to life. And then finally, I wanna thank Springer's team. If any of you are watching, I just get the privilege of telling this story, but you are the ones who made it happen as well. And most of all, Springer, the whale, the whale changed all of our lives. I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation now. Um, okay, everybody, can you see it okay? Yes. Okay. Okay, so thank you everyone. I'm really happy to be here. And I'm gonna spend a little bit of time talking about um, Springer's story and then the Southern Residence a bit. And then I'm going to close with a with a reading a few selections from the book at the end. And I hope we'll I'm hoping to leave plenty of time for questions uh, and a discussion at the end. So here we go. Hope you're all comfortable. Um, my story, first I'm going to talk a little bit about my story with the orcas, how it all began. And I came late to them, I will say. I was raised in Southern California and uh, was attuned to and really liked whales and dolphins the way most people generally do. The first orcas I ever saw were Northern resident orcas, Corky and Orky, at a place called Marineland of the Pacific. I went to UC Santa Cruz and many of my friends there majored in things like marine biology and they studied elephant seals uh, and other marine mammals, but I, I was really focused on something else. And then I moved to Seattle in 1982 and I started dreaming about the whales and I started dreaming about orcas specifically. And I had a, a dream about the whales in the Strait of Juan de Fuca that really caught my attention. I was so new to Seattle when I had the dream, I didn't know what the Strait of Juan de Fuca was. <laughs> I had to look it up in a dictionary. And 
this curiosity about who these orcas were um, really uh, caught me. And I, the more I learned, the more I wanted to know. I found out that orcas were, first of all, the top predator in the sea um, because they work together to catch their prey. They're sometimes called the wolves of the sea and they can basically take down anything. There's nothing that can take down an orca, but because how they work together, they can, they can hunt and catch anything. And most of what I learned, I learned from a book I bought at Elliott Bay Book Company called Orca the Well-Called Killer by Eric Hoyt. And that, um, that book went down like water in the desert. I learned so much about orcas uh, and our history with them from that book. And it's still, I think, the gold standard for all orca books. So as I mentioned, they were the top predators in the sea. They live in every ocean. Um, they're one of the most widely distributed marine mammals. This is a chart prepared by our friend the Order for Noah Fisheries that shows how many uh, types of workers are all in the world. They generally look the same, but there are morphological and big cultural differences between them. How do we tell them apart? Well, we tell orcas apart first by their dorsal fins. Uh, male dorsal fins can get to be five or six feet high and females are generally around two to three feet. And the shape of each dorsal fin is unique. They have nicks and scars and specific shapes. And we also can tell them apart by their saddle patches. Their saddle patches are like fingerprints on humans with unique, with unique shapes. And finally, we can also tell them apart by the calls that they make. I'm going to give this a try and see if it works. This is J-Pod. Oops. I think that worked. I'm just going to keep going, but every, every pod has distinct calls. It did. Oh, good. Okay. Um, there are three kinds of orcas in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they're called, they're also called ecotypes. And they're differentiated by what they eat and where they live and um, how they, their family structures. So resident orcas are fish eaters who eat salmon and they live in big family groups and they travel in the same general areas. They're loyal to specific areas. Bigs or transient orcas eat marine mammals. They can eat, um, some eat seals uh, or porpoises, and some eat uh, larger whales and um, larger whales. And then there's a group called offshores that live in the Pacific, in the deeper Pacific Ocean, and they, they rarely come ashore or come close to shore. One of the most amazing things that I learned about orcas is that what they eat and how they hunt is cultural, taught to them by their families. Although they are the top predator in the sea, predator in the sea, even though they could eat something else, they generally they don't. They eat what their what their families have taught them to eat. So the southern resident orcas, for example, have been perfectly evolved to catch salmon and Chinook salmon above all while the marine mammal eating or orcas around here eat seals. And uh, I know people often wonder, why don't the whales just switch? And it's not that simple. As far as we know, orcas are actually pretty conservative. They stick to what they know, sometimes to their detriment. So as I mentioned, resident orcas eat fish and they prefer Chinook salmon above all. They eat a lot of other kinds of fish too, not just salmon, they'll eat halibut, um, lots of other things, but the, if there are Chinook salmon around, they will prefer that over all others. And orcas, like all whales and dolphins, have a wide variety of behaviors, things like breaching, spy hopping, that's when they stick their heads out of the water and look around. Their eyesight is just as good as humans. Um, porpoising is when they move really fast. Orcas don't sleep. Like other whales and dolphins, they don't actually uh, go completely asleep. They're always partially awake, but they do form, go into these rest periods. Their behavior states go for like, a, you know, they, they shift these different behaviors throughout the day. And sometimes you can see them all grouped up and resting. Tail lobbing is a behavior. I hope you can see there that that Seattle, uh, right in the background there, um, the orcas slap their tails against the water. And the southern residents especially have a habit called kelping. When they go along the west side of San Juan Islands, they find a great kelp 
over and around their dorsal fins. And it looks like, um, it looks like it's just a fun tactile thing for them to do. People want, of course, we, everyone wants to know why the whales do the thing, the things they do. And I think sometimes it's just as fun as it looks. Uh, people often all want to know too, how long do orcas live? And their lifespans are very similar to humans. Um, females can live to be uh, 60 to 80 years. And this is a picture of a very well-known whale called Granny from J-Pod who actually was estimated to be over a hundred years old. Males generally live less, they live fewer years. They, um, they are generally between 40 and 60 years. And here in Puget Sound, we have, uh, Puget Sound is home to three resident three pods of southern resident orcas, JK and L pod, I should say the Salish Sea. These whales use the Salish Sea for a good part of the year and the part of the Pacific coast, as far south as Monterey, California. The other amazing thing about these orcas is that they stay with their mothers their whole lives long. So sons and daughters stay with their mother and the mother stays with her mother who stays with her mother. So when you see orcas, when you see resident orcas here, you can be seeing three or four generations of whales swimming together. We had K-Pod here in Puget Sound today, by the way. It's very exciting. There's some photos of J-Pod. Here was K-Pod a couple of years ago. And this also, this is a big brother babysitting his younger sister, J-53. And they do come into the central sound uh, near Seattle, October through February, following the winter chum runs. So we'll get, we'll talk about this later, but it's the more we can do to bring back run, salmon runs around Puget Sound really matter to these whales. Humans and orcas, uh, orcas have been here longer than people, but humans and orcas have been connected since they have shared this landscape. They're very important in, uh, in, for, in Native American cultures here. Um, you can see them, you can see they are honored and celebrated in stories, songs, sculpture and art, and in fact are considered and treated as relatives. In the 1960s, uh, a disruptive and traumatizing chapter for the Southern residents when an orca was captured up in uh, Vancouver, accidentally, a, 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 it was, turned out to be a J-Pod whale, we now know, but it was a J-Pod whale called um, uh, Moby Doll. And he was uh, injured, but didn't die. And he was held at a harbor in Vancouver where hundreds of people turned out to come and see him. And it taught, it taught people that orcas were not like sharks, that in fact, this whale was uh, gentle and seemed to be intelligent and um, very engaging. And almost overnight, the interest in engaging with orcas closely grew and this whole capture era began. The next year, um, the whale started becoming captured in Puget Sound and uh, cats, the Southern resident orcas bore the brunt of that. More than 40, um, more than 63 orcas were removed from the Salish Sea, and most of those were Southern residents. Of those, there's only two that are alive today. Corky, who I had coincidentally seen at Marineland and who is still alive at SeaWorld San Diego, and Lolita, who is the Southern resident orca currently at the Miami Sea Aquarium. And that is Lolita there on that slide. Washington State sued to stop the captures in 1976. And that brought that era to a, a, a close in our state. But then the population, happily, the population had been reduced to just 71 orcas. They started increasing year after year. The good news is they started increasing and appeared to be recovering up to 98 orcas in 1996. And at the same time, I'm sharing you this, is, these are all the things I learned as I was uh, kind of diving into the world of the orcas. And at the same time, my curiosity became a hobby and then a passion. And then in, in the 1990s, I hosted my first event about orcas, uh, a talk with Paul Spong. And then in 1995, I hosted a festival at, on the waterfront. Um, and uh, we had a symposium about Lolita in 1996. 
And for my livelihood, I was doing lots of other things. I started out waitressing when I moved to Seattle. I became a, a technical editor and I eventually found my way to, um, to when Macintoshes were brand new, I found my way to Aldis and Adobe Systems where I happily landed for a long time. And all these threads came together in 2002 when a friend of mine, Mark Sears, got a call that there was a young orca near the Vashon Ferry. It was a quartermaster on the Vashon Ferry who first discovered her. And this was curious because uh, orcas, as we know, are, are rarely seen alone, especially one so young. So Mark went out to have a look and sure enough, the quartermaster was correct. This was a young orca. And she came right up to the boat and spy hopped and hopefully, help, helpfully she turned over so Mark could see that she was a female. Their orca's markings are different on their undersides. That's how we know the difference between male and females. The oddest thing about this little whale is that her saddle patch was obscured. Remember I said that saddle patches are how we, how we know the difference between the orcas. They're like fingerprints on humans. And on this little whale, her saddle patch was really pale and her skin models. You couldn't see her saddle patch. So it was quite a mystery. Here's this little whale by herself. And who was she? She, so Mark went out every day to kind of look at the whale. He alerted uh, researchers at uh, NOAA Fisheries, people like Brad Hansen, and he let the people, uh, it's a relatively small orca world between researchers and pretty soon they all knew there was this uh, wayward orca here uh, between Vashon Island and West Seattle basically. And um, she seemed to be healthy enough uh, but she was underweight, and you can see that depression behind her blowhole there. That's uh, when whales are hungry or emaciated, that can become very pronounced and lead to a condition called um, peanut head. She wasn't that far gone, but she was, it was worrisome that she had that depression. At the same time, she seemed to have a lot of energy. She was breaching, she was playful, and she was catching food on her own. That was the most amazing thing. Orcas this age generally rely on their families to help uh, catch fish with and for them. And probably one of the most endearing things about her and important things in the end was that she had a fondness for stick and Mark for sticks. And Mark found that when he went out in his boat, he could kind of wave a stick and she would come from wherever she was and charge toward the boat like a puppy. And then she would play with that stick. You can see her rolling it on her belly there and on her side and on her back. And so Mark actually collected one of the sticks and he tied it to his tied it to a rope in his boat so that when he needed to call her close for researchers or veterinarians, they had a sure way of getting her close to boats, which to when they needed to get a close look at her. That was immensely helpful, helpful over time. Here's a, uh, this is Springer. You can see the stick tied to Mark's boat. And there she was. So it went on this way for about two weeks. Uh, and of course, the big question was, who is she? Where did she come from? People thought maybe she wasn't offshore. Um, there was no Southern resident orca, her age and size missing from the population. And because we know the life history of every individual in these, in the resident pods, it, it was clear she wasn't a Southern resident. So I think there was strong, um, people were strongly thinking that she was probably a transient or an offshore whale. And the puzzle was solved when Joe Olson, who's a local hydrophone maker, went out to record Springer. And he, uh, he got some calls and played them for a marine a biologist named uh, Dave Bain. And amazingly, Dave Bain, had done, uh, Dave Bain had done research with Northern resident pods on the north end of Vancouver Island. And Springer made, let's see if this will play.
It's very quiet. Oh, there she is. Yeah. Well, anyway, that you can hear her echoing, locating in a little bit of a call there. She she made a call. She made a bunch of noise that was not significant, but then she made a call that could only have come from a pod called the A4 pod who live on the north end of Vancouver Island and they're northern resident pods. And Dave Bain, who listened to these calls, happened to know those calls really well because he had studied her family when he was doing his graduate research. So he immediately identified the call that she was making as a call that could only have come from the A4 family. And then it got a lot easier to figure out who she was. Researchers on both sides of the border looked through their files to see which member of A4 pod is missing. And that's how they figured out it was Springer. Springer and her mother had come to Johnstone Strait. They returned to Johnstone Strait with their pod in the summer of 2000 when she was first observed. The next year in 2001, neither of them came back with their pod. So everybody believed that um, she had died because normally when, a, when the mother disappears, the calf does too for a calf so young. Somehow Springer had not only survived the loss of her mother, but her found her way to Seattle. And that story was filled in a little bit more when uh, a researcher, Graham Ellis, had a picture of Springer with a pod called G-Pod that had traveled as far south as the Strait of Juan de Fuca that winter. So perhaps she had kind of hitchhiked with, she, she wasn't tightly bonded to G-Pod, but she, she traveled with G-Pod and got us pretty far south and then turned into the Strait. So now the question was, what should we do? The agency in charge of marine mammals in uh, whales and dolphins in the US is NOAA Fisheries. So this was ultimately their decision. Because she was a Northern resident orca, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans was also a partner in this decision and in whatever management approach was gonna be taken. So NOAA, actually People for Puget Sound hosted a town meeting at the hall at Fontaroy here in West Seattle. And NOAA Fisheries, let the community know these were what they were thinking. Uh, this is these are the things they were thinking of doing. Everyone, every day that Springer was here, awareness of her grew, and people were getting more and more worried about what about the little whale, and uh, very concerned that she would be taken care of in some helpful way. So the options Noah was considering was to either leave her alone, to send her to an aquarium to try to re rehabilitate her via an aquarium and then return her to her pod, hopefully, or rehabilitate her in situ somewhere in Puget Sound and then re re relocate her. If we were going to try to return her to her family, she did have to spend some time in human care because she needed to be tested to make sure she didn't have a disease that would put the wild population at risk. So she would have to be temporarily captured long enough to make to assess her health and make sure she could survive the trip back home and that she didn't have any any diseases. All these all these uh, options were risky, and um, this had never been done before. So Joe Scordino, who was the deputy deputy administrator of NOAA at the time, asked us, the community, what do you want? That was why they held that meeting, to get input from the community. Most people believed that Springer was sick and perhaps dying in front of us. So a lot of people urged that she be rescued right away and sent to an aquarium. And it was a young boy who first stood up at this very crowded meeting with the TV cameras rolling. And he said that she might not be lost, and she not, might, might not be sick, but just lost, and she should have a chance to go home. And he said her family probably misses her. And I don't think any of us who were there that night will ever forget his clear voice ringing out across that crowded room. And I followed up a few minutes, a few, uh, sorry, I followed up a few minutes later and I supported that and said that we, the nonprofits in the area, uh, NOAA fisheries, if they picked the in situ option, we were very concerned that if she went to an aquarium, no matter how well intended, she might not come out. 
And we really wanted to give her the best possible chance to stay wild and to go home to her family. And that seemed like an in situ rehabilitation. Finding a place in Puget Sound was the best way to do that. So a few weeks went by, Noah and DFO considered their options. And a few weeks later at another town meeting on Vashon Island, they announced they had chosen the option that we really supported. And they were going to rescue her, keep her in a holding pen over at Manchester, Washington. And if she was healthy enough, she'd be returned to her pod on the north end of Vancouver Island. The goal was to get her up to the north end of Vancouver Island um, when her family was likely to be there. Although, of course, there was no guarantee they would be there. They, sometimes they don't even come back to the Straits each summer. So Noah had committed to this plan, uh, and now they were going to need our help. So we kept our end of the bargain and we did assemble a group of nonprofits. Uh, my, my nonprofit at the time was called Orca Alliance and these seven organizations formed a single fundraising group called the Orphan Orca Fund. And we had an agreement with ourselves and we had an agreement with NOAA Fisheries and we set about to try to help NOAA undertake this huge risky expensive project so that Springer could go home. Uh, NOAA Fisheries, Lynn Berry at NOAA Fisheries brought us a, a, an Excel sheet that had a long list of things they would need for the rescue. And we all basically signed up for things that we would ask the community for. It was like going on a giant uh, community scavenger hunt. And it was a wonderful experience because everyone we called had heard of Springer and they wanted to help. So everybody said yes to anything that was asked of them. And the whole community really did step up. Some examples were there was a dive shop in Edmonds that donated scuba tanks. Um, PCC and Thriftway donated, donated groceries. Ferries donated ferry passes. For these, the human caretakers would need things too. And then for the whale herself, they needed like a foam pad for her to rest on when she was uh, in transport on barges, a scale to weigh her. And um, Woodland Park Zoo and SeaWorld, a lot of, uh, places stepped up with the supplies that NOAA would need to actually take care of the whale. The pen over in Manchester, which is a fish and wildlife facility. And uh, NOAA hired a, an expert team led by Jeff Foster to come and work with Springer. Jeff and his team had worked with Keiko. And so they were the handful of people in the world who had experience trying to return an orca, uh, rehabilitate and return an orca to the wild. Um, so the rescue day was set uh, when everything was ready. And on June 13th, Springer was um, lifted, placed in a sling. And you can see her being lifted by crane and float, uh, lifted onto a barge and then traveled by barge over to Manchester where she was lowered into her pen. Oops. And the next, uh, right away she was tested. Um, and then uh, while she was in Manchester, the goal of the team was to keep her as wild as possible. Um, no one wanted her to lose stamina or lose the ability to catch fish. So everything they did was uh, strategize to keep her wild. So that's Dr. Pete Schrader there in the team uh, giving her some tests. And Pete and uh, the Dave, um, Dave Huff, who was from the Vancouver Aquarium, she, she was dewormed. She got a deworming medicine. And that turned out to be the most serious thing wrong with her. She had a bad case of worms. And Dr. Pete gave her two doses of deworming medicine. And she went from eating two salmon a day to 15. While she was there, um, as I mentioned, they the team wanted to keep her as wild as possible. So a few way, strategies they used to do that. First, they wanted to minimize human contact. They didn't want her to get too used to people. She needed to stay wild. And she was a lonely, curious, intelligent, playful little two-year-old whale, very connectable. But everybody knew that for her best interest, people could not um, get her used to communicating or connecting with them. Only a handful of people, Jeff's team and the vet's team had direct contact with her. 
she was, however, monitored 24 hours a day while she was at uh, Manchester. And you can see they built a pen around, they built a, a visual barrier around the pen. So even people just walking down the dock wouldn't exit, you know, it, unintentionally make eye contact with her. And they had remote cameras. So she was monitored around the clock. If anything happened, it, someone would notice it. And I think doctor, the vets were there 24 hours a day on call. They, they gave her natural toys to play with, things like kelp, streams of water, and of course, her stick. They, one of the biggest risks is they didn't want her to associate people with food. So they uh, fed Springer live salmon through this tube that they called a, a, a salmon slide. And at random times throughout the day, the team would introduce live salmon through this. Again, she was able, they didn't want her to lose the ability to catch live salmon. Um, but Springer was a smart little whale. <laughs> and um, at the same time, the team was monitoring her health. They were monitoring her behaviors to making sure that she was healthy and alert and engaged in playing. Um, and she was, and this was a, just, I, I love seeing this, the or Orphan Orca Fund. These were the scuba tanks donated by the dog shop. After, week after week, she had medical tests that kept coming back clear. They would take tests, send them away, and then test them again to make sure that the results were uh, repeatable. And finally, uh, nearly a month later, Springer was ready to go home. And I, you can already see how much weight she's put on and how much better her, her skin looks. At the same time that Canada was preparing for Vancouver Island, the Johnson Strait area, um, they picked a place on Blackfish Sound called Dong, Cher Dong Chong Bay on Hanson Island. And it's conveniently right around the corner from Orca Lab where Paul Spong and Helena Simons uh, have been studying and recording orcas for a long time. So on July 13th, Springer was loaded up on a donated catamaran donated by Nickel Brothers. Uh, Nichols Brothers on Whidbey Island donated this catamaran to carry Springer home. She was, uh, they were going up the Inside Passage and a Native American dance group and First Nations dance group um, said goodbye to her. They waited for her on the Vashon ferry dock and sang as she left, as she left Seattle. Um, the journey took most of a day. Uh, they left early in the morning, like at 630. They made a stop in Campbell River. They needed more ice to keep her uh, holding tank, the water in her tank cool. And then they reached, um, they re reached Dong Chong Bay and Hanson Island around 5.30 that night. She was monitored on the trip to make sure she stayed stable. And in the meantime, I had gone up to Canada because I wanted to be there. A group of us from the Orf Orphan Orca Fund just wanted to watch the catamaran as it went by and just witness it uh, for all of us who'd been part of the project here. That's uh, the entrance to Alert Bay, the home of the killer whale. We went to Dong Chong Bay. We, we, we were invited to come aboard a friend's boat in Dong Chong Bay where we waited. And as we waited all day long, um, more and more people came over from Alert Bay in fishing boats and in skiffs, they ferried ashore to the shores of Hanson Island and waited. And when the catamaran came around the corner, the whole bay became alive with singing and drumming and paddlers went out to greet the catamaran, to greet Springer. This, this was a huge event uh, for the Namgis people. So Springer was lifted from the catamaran one more time. She was taken to the barge and then brought by barge back into the bay, given one last round of blood test and then lowered into her pen. She was back in BC waters. The first thing that happened was Chief Bill Cramner from the Nongis Nation welcomed her home in Kwakwala. So two nations, and hundreds of people and companies and nonprofits had done everything they could to make this moment happen, but the next was be up to the whales. The plan was to release Springer ideally to her family, if and when they came by. If her family didn't come by, they would release her to um, other whales, hopefully her relatives. Um, so now it began the, the wait. 
And then overnight, something amazing happened. Um, there were hydrophones in Springer's pen, and uh, from where, from Paul and Helena's lab, they heard this. This is Springer hearing northern resident orcas uh, nearby. So I hope you can hear, you know, yes. Springer, Springer's excitement is um, is clear, and you can almost hear the whales saying, "Who's that?" And this reverie, they just settled into this back and forth that went on for hours. Um, it was an incredible moment for we didn't hear that, time, of course, but um, Leonard from Vancouver Aquarium, who was there, heard it, and and Paul and Helena and everyone who was listening and. It was quite a quite a moment to hear Springer talking again with her uh, her her extended family. And then the next day, I will say sooner than anyone expected or would have dared dream, um, the team got word that the A4 pod was in Johnstone Strait and in fact in fact on their way to Buckfish Sound and on their way to Springer's Pen. Less than 24 hours after she'd been returned, her grandmother and her aunts and her cousins basically swam by to get her. And this is what it looked like. At last, Springer is free in her home arms. So that was uh, quite a moment for everyone there watching. Um, I tell this story in the book. I, I, we weren't aware. We, we were up there, but we weren't, of course, aware that Springer had been released. I was nearby, and uh, fr a friend and I were on our way to visit Orca Lab, just to visit Orca Lab. And we happened to encounter Springer shortly after she'd been released. It was quite a moment, and it took a minute to realize what we were seeing that we were seeing Springer swimming free in Johnstone Strait less than 24 hours since we'd gone back. It was really, really, really incredible. Um, what happened is that when the whales, they did join up right away, but then Springer kind of went to the left and they went to the right. And in those first couple of weeks, it was a little touch and go. She had lost stamina, even though she'd only been in human care for a month, she had a hard time keeping up with the whales to begin with. But over that summer, she did uh, become integrated with her, her pod again. And some whales, there was a brother sister pair who seemed to um, take her under their flippers. They actually tried, it looked like they were keeping her away from boats a few times. And, uh, she, they, and they shared their salmon with her. <laughs> she learned to be an orca again. So the rest of that, the, so she stayed, she, by the end of the summer, she seemed to be fully integrated. But of course, the big question was, will she come back? Um, the orcas leave, leave that area and go to the coast of the central coast of BC and um, the, it, for the winter. And so there would be a big gap where no one would know where she was or how she was doing. And the next year, July, in July of 2003, uh, Captain Bill McKay actually found Springer and um, the A4 pod as they came, returned for the first time that year, almost to, the, almost to the day that she'd been released. And I will tell you, there were cheers up and down the coast. Everyone was so happy. This was a huge conservation milestone. It was an open scientific question whether her family would accept her, would they recognize her? Would they accept her? Would she be able to go home with them? And this showed that yes, the answer to all that was yes. They did recognize her, she could go home. And a year later, she was still with them. And year after year, she 
the, the story continued. In 2007, we decided to host a reunion for Springer's team. All of us who'd worked so hard on the project, especially here in the US, many people who'd worked on it had never seen her or seen her seen that part of the world. So we had this anniversary uh, celebration in Telegraph Cove. And we went on a whale watch with uh, Jim Barman aboard the Geekami. And we encountered Springer and her pod. Uh, and for a while, it was just us, just our boat and her pod. And following them, five years to the hour, we were in front of Dong, Dong Chong Bay, um, where she had been released from. So uh, year after year, she was monitored mostly with through uh, DFO and the Vancouver Aquarium studies. They do those surveys on the coast. And every time they came across Springer, it was always good news. And you can see she got better and uh, bigger and bigger, and you can see her beautiful clear saddle patch year after year. We held another reunion in 2012. And later that year, we got the best news of all that Springer had, had her first calf. So that was another conservation milestone. Not only had she survived, but now she was a mother herself and contributing to the population. We had at that same time we had a celebration here on Island where we added a new whale trail sign. And later that year in 2017, we got the even better news that Springer had, had another calf. So Springer now has a pod of her own. At our reunions, we always talk about what did we learn? What did we learn from Springer? And of course, the first message is that orcas can go home again. For me, one of the important lessons was that um, we learned how to work together. Uh, governments and community don't often work together as closely as we did. And groups don't often work together that way and governments don't often work together. And for this, we all had to learn to take risks together and trust each other. And I think key to it also was that we put Springer's best interest first. We had a shared vision of success and that we all did want the whale to be returned to her family safely. And as, like with any project, we had a deadline <laughs> that helps. That helps. Um, we couldn't spend a lot of time. Um, decisions had to get made to get her home in time. And of course, the reason why it really worked was because of Springer. She turned out to be resilient, spirited, and smart. And her family, her family came to get her less than 24 hours after she was returned. So I consider these Springer's gifts, what she left behind and what she left behind were relationships across organizations, cultures, agencies, and countries. So in 2005, while Springer was thriving, the Southern residents were uh, doing worse every year and they were dying younger and sooner than they should from three key threats, not enough salmon, too many toxins and stress and noise from boats that work together in a terrible way. So I decided to do something to help the Southern residents. And we started a project called the Whale Trail, which is a series of sites, a series of places you can watch whales from shore. And we started with many members of Springer's team, um, including, uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, um, the Whale Museum, the Seattle Aquarium, people from Puget Sound and NOAA Fisheries. And uh, each page, each site has a page on our website and each of them is marked with a sign. So for me, this is a very real and every um, everyday reminder of Springer's success and her legacy is that now all the way from California to British Columbia, we have these locations where you can watch whales from shore. The whale trail was inaugurated at Salt Creek by the um, and welcomed. We were welcomed by the Lower Alwa Clallam tribe. We have two signs on every ferry. Uh, in 2013, we made it down to uh, made it to the Pacific Coast with a sign at Kalalock, and then we added our first signs in California at the southern end of the Southern Resident Orca Range. I Springer had given me hope that we can save the Southern Residents the same way that we saved her. Saving a population is harder and it won't be as immediate, 
but I now have absolute confidence that if we put the whales first and we work together, that nature can heal, that the Southern residents can recover the same way that Springer did. Just like with Springer, it's gonna take all of us to save the Southern residents. They're down to just 71 now. I'm just gonna spend a couple minutes talking about the Southern residents because it's important for me both with this book and with this presentation that we are not just looking back at something good that happened, but that we're inspired to take the lessons we learned to apply them to the issues we're facing today. Here in the sound that will certainly cover the Southern resident orcas. So there's only uh, 73 orcas now. The threats remain the same, not enough salmon, too many toxins and too much noise. Um, I'm gonna go through these kind of quickly because I know we're, we're getting low on time here, but the orcas need 18 to 25 salmon a day. They prefer Chinook camp, salmon. They eat salmon that comes from all over the Northwest, the Klamath River, the Sacramento, Sacramento River, Puget Sound, as I mentioned, Winter Chum and the, and the Fraser River. So what can we do? Of course, there are some big projects we can do, but there's tons of little ones too. These are pictures of a la salmon ladder right here near where I live at Fontoura Creek, where we had, I think, over 300, uh, almost 300 chum salmon return this year, um, thanks to the work of citizen volunteers and salmon in schools who put eggs in the stream to begin with, um, or put fish in the stream to begin with. So there are big things and little things that we all can do. And I, especially if there's young readers uh, listening, I, that's the biggest message I want you to take is that there are plenty of things that we can do right now, right where you are. Groups like the Mid Sound Fisheries and Hanseries Group or the Salmon in, School, Salmon in Schools can help, uh, help you know where there are projects to restore habitat and do things that will, bring, that will protect salmon and forage fish. Same thing with toxin accumulations. There are big things we need to do, but we can also make choices in, how, in what, we, um, what we use to take care of our home, what we use to take care of our yard, and in our choices of if we, uh, if we drive or if we walk or ride our bike. And finally, noise and disturbance is one of the easiest things we can do something about. Noise and disturbance makes it really hard for the orcas to find their food. They need to echolocate, and, uh, which means they send out the stream of clicks and if they can't to find their salmon. And if they, can't, if they can't do that, if there's a wall of noise in between them and their salmon, it's like blinding us. It's like, it's like blinding us. They, can't, they effectively can't see. So one simple thing we can do is turn down the noise, turn down the volume in the Salish Sea. And there are lots of good things going on to that end. Um, Right, we, we recommend, and I believe that not, it's time to stop watching the Southern residents from boats, period. If you're on the water, stay a thousand yards away from them. Give them the space to find food. And especially for young listeners, um, some of the lessons I think that I learned from Springer, keep learning, you know, keep an open mind, keep asking and follow the facts. Um, take whatever choices you make, let them be informed by science and facts. Share the story, tell your friends about it, and let your voice be heard. Write letters to your um, to your people in your city and state and national government. Your voice matters. And I think this is, you know, we're in a state where we're not often going to, any of us are going to have a chance to rescue an orca again, but the lessons we learned apply for not just for orcas, but for everything. And I would encourage you to be bold, think big, find your pod, find people you can work with and speak up when it matters. Most of all, choose hope. Springer, that's of all the gifts that Springer gave me, that's what it that's what Springer gave us, gave me most of all. She showed me what's possible when people work together and put the whales first. The whales and the world need you. This is a picture of Springer's matriline. And this we just got a couple of weeks ago from Lance Barrett Leonard, a drone study that Springer and her two calves spy hopping, looking at a drone. <laughs>
And what year, when is the, what year is that? This is this year. Oh, this so is. Springer's very healthy. She's very healthy. In fact, she might look overweight because at the same time, uh, they discovered through drone, th drone studies that she's expecting her third calf. Hooray. Oh my goodness. Wow. Yeah. And it was announced the same day the book was published. So I'm taking that entirely oh. personally. Oh, oh, that's so lovely. Yeah. Oops. Yeah. So I, I wanted to say thank you to everybody for listening. If we have time, I can do a quick reading um, or should we go right to questions? I have a, well, so other than how Springer is doing today, I had a question that, why did you choose to write this as a children's book? Um, because I thought it was so important to get this story out. Most people haven't heard this story. Most people don't know this story. And to me, it really is, I wanted uh, kids especially to know that this had happened. This was, I started writing it, of course, before the pandemic, but now, um, I think we have a, a, a pandemic of despair. I think it's easy to feel a sense of despair of, and fear about the world and especially about the natural world and here where we are about the orcas. And so I think this story and this book are medicine for that, to be reminded of a time when people really did put, put their best heads and their best efforts together and everybody had a role to play. You know, we nonprofits did our part, kids, the companies who donated things did their part, and the decision makers were courageous and took big risks. And I think those are the same ingredients that will help us be successful with the Southern residents or anything we face. So that was, that was my deepest hope, to, to, give, to give kids hope and show them what's possible. That's so lovely. Had you ever heard of another orca playing with a stick? <laughs> no, I haven't. And one of the best things I learned last year, uh, there's a researcher up in Canada named Jared Towers, and he told me that Springer still plays with sticks. Oh my gosh. She was in Johnstone Strait last year, and he watched her tossing a stick back and forth with her calf spirit. I love it. That's <laughs> so crazy. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that struck me about the, the, information about whales is vocalizations. Can you talk a little bit about how unique they are? Yeah, I, well, it's John Ford who did all the original research for this up in, up in Canada. And um, he just took thousands and thousands of recordings and examined the spectrographs. I think that's the word, you know, to show the breakout, what, the, what they look like. <laughs> and over time, just got to realize there was a diet, there were dialects, there were certain calls that were only used by members of the same family. Huh. And, you know, as they grew to realize who the families were, they, and, and over time, even witnessed the births and things like that, they knew who was related to each other. So there are some calls that are only shared by pods. There are other calls that are shared across pods, but um, there, like, I don't think there's any calls that are shared by all the pods. Here, same thing with our Southern residents. They can talk, you know, they can, and all pod have unique calls, and then they have some calls that are shared across the population, I think. <laughs> Interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, someone here is asking if you ever learned the name of the boy who spoke up at that community meeting. Maybe there's a possibility of you doing a joint venture together. <laughs> you know, if he's, I, I would love to find him. I, I think there's archival footage of that um, town meeting somewhere because it was covered by every, every major news station. Um, I don't know. I don't know his name. I wish I did. Um, and I hope, I hope we can find him. Nice. Really nice. Speaking of names, who names the calves? Who names all of the, uh, well, it, who gives them their yeah, names? Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, in Canada, it's the Vancouver Aquarium, which is now ocean wise. Um, and actually John Ford started that uh, program of naming the whales as part of an adoption program to fund his studies on acoustics. Um, and they, uh, um, so, and in Canada, they're generally named after place names. They're named for places near where the whale is first spotted. Got it. In the US, it's the Whale Museum. So the Southern residents are all named by the Whale Museum. 
and generally they, I, I think now they generally have contests where they get, um, you can oh. find, find, a, find a good, so the, and people can suggest names for the whales too. And then I think they usually vote, sometimes they let people vote on them too, what the whale should be named. Mm -hmm. Nice. So every whale has an ID number, like Springer mm -hmm. is A73, which means she's a member of the A pod and she was the 73rd whale born to that group. And that's unique. There will never be another A73. That's their, their ID number stays with them for life. And, um, and then they also get a familiar name. Mm -hmm. Nice. Mm -hmm. If there's no other questions, I just want to remind everyone that you are going to be stopping into Elliott Bay to sign our stock. We won't be able to have a, a, a live event, I'm sorry to say, but we will have signed copies of Orca Rescue for anyone who's interested. Thank you so much for being with us this evening, Donna. Yeah. I'm, I'm really, really grateful for everyone spending time. I know we all spent a lot of time on Zoom. Um, I was wondering if I could, should just close with a reading from the book. I'd love that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm so, um, this, the book covers a lot of what I talked about um, and a lot more. So I hope you do check out the book. It's got lots of great fact pages about whales and it's got maps and map lines. And I think, I think, um, I think people of all ages, I hope they love it. Um, so I'm going to read a section from that reunion, that first reunion that we went to, that we organized in 2007. The Killer Whale Cafe was buzzing. As each new person came through the door, we cheered. Springer's team was gathered at Telegraph Cove with our families and friends. It was the first time everyone was together since Springer had gone home. Maybe this was what it felt like to be in a super pod. Captain Jim told us that Springer and her family had returned to the area the day before. They were last seen at the far eastern end of Johnstone Strait. It was hard to sleep that night. The next day we boarded the Geekami. Everyone was bundled up. A low hanging fog had settled on the strait. We were barely outside Telegraph Cove when we saw one pod, then another and another. Captain Jim kept heading east, slowing down just before we got to Robson Bight. We weren't sure why he'd slowed down until we saw blows close to shore and heading our way. Yalcott's family was approaching. Suddenly, there they were. Springer surfaced with her cousin Skeena, a young male. A hush fell over the boat as we listened to their blows. As the orcas crossed Johnstone Strait, we followed slowly behind. There were no other boats or whales around. It was just us as we followed Springer and her family into Blackfish Sound. Ribbons of fog draped the, ribbons of fog draped the trees. We passed Orca Lab where Paul and Helena were watching. The whales kept going until they and we were at the entrance to Dong Chong, to Dong Chong Bay. Five years to the day and almost to the hour, we were with Spring and her family at the, at the place where she'd been released. We lingered, we lingered a while longer. Then we said goodbye to Springer and headed back to Telegraph Cove. We had done our part to bring everyone together. The whales had done the rest. Thank you again, Donna, <laughs> and thank you to everyone who came tonight. Uh, I can't wait for people to be introduced to your book. It is gorgeous. The illustrations are just beautiful. It's a wonderful, wonderful story. And thank you so much for your positivity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for hosting me. This was wonderful. And thank you everyone for coming.